I'm recording. Okay, we're on. Got it. <laughs> okay, Mr. Tutera. Welcome back. That's my dad. That's like, I'm sorry. Yeah. David. Yes. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love when you're here. I love when you're here. We all love when David Tatera is on the Big Wedding Planning Podcast. And oh, this is a big one. This is this is home weddings. Weddings at a home, at a private home are just like beyond in so many ways. Yeah, it's it's a big, listen, it sounds like a great idea and it's very intimate and personal, but there's a lot that comes with it that I know the two of us are going to share, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and the costs. Oof. Yeah. So that's, that's where I wanted to start because this is a common misconception. I would say, you know, 98% of the time a wedding at a private home is actually going to cost you more, not only money, but like, just, just, there's just so much more to think about, uh, because a home is really not normally, uh, designed in a way to allow for a great flow for a big event. It's normally. So true. So true. It, it, you know, in the course of my career, so many people have said, so listen, David, I really want to have my party, my wedding it, it, at my home. It's my mom's, you know, wonderful location that she feels it's more emotional and it'd be very more about our family. And then I, I, I try to sit them down with some clarity doesn't always work the first time you have the conversation, but you're right. A home is built as a home. It isn't built as a venue. It doesn't have multiple areas for catering facilities or for bathroom restrooms to be used. So what comes with that, which we're going to get go through you and you and me together, is that it equates to, quite frankly, a larger budget. Then if you were to actually walk into a beautiful venue, which is built for the purposes of having a big wedding or a small wedding. Yeah. And I mean, let's, I don't want to start this off, be like, don't do it because I love like the, the, these are like my specialty. I love doing home, weddings at, in, in people's homes. I think it's just adds so much more intimate emotion. Yes. Um, and as a planner, it's a challenge that I love. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I do agree. Yeah. So I think, you know, in terms of we were thinking pros and cons, obviously the intimacy and this beautiful experience and this comfort level yeah. are huge pros. They are. And, and you know, it's <clears throat> at some point during our, our time together today, I want to share one that we had at our home. Yes. Not, not here in California. We actually hosted... Um, a, a wedding for my aunt Maria, who's like my older sister. And I'll share with you just sort of the hysterics of it all. Yes. Um, it was beautiful and emotional and just unique. But I want to share with what we went through to create that moment, which everybody listening can do. Well, let's talk about Aunt Maria's then. Let's just go there because it's fresh oh, on okay. your mind. Um, so when Maria came to me, she's like, yeah, like she's like my big sister. She's my mom's younger sister. So she's incredibly a big part of my, my life. And she said, David, I'm getting married. And what do you think about having the wedding at your home in Connecticut? And I thought, yeah, absolutely. It's, we have the space. It's, it's really legitimately a magical location visually and spiritually. So we took it on and we wanted to make sure that it really represented the two of them. So with that, it was bringing on obviously a catering team. We brought in a tent. Mm -hmm. We floored the tent. We made sure that we had beautiful access to every facility that was needed. We had um, wonderful restroom um, facilities brought in so people didn't go into the house and create, you know, the challenges that can happen when you back up the, the septic tank or all of those things that you need to be really aware of. Oh my God. Um, lighting company, details were beautiful. And Maria was just over the moon, her and her husband, because it really was personal, like you shared, mm -hmm. right, Michelle? So it's like, it made it really feel like this was just about bringing 150 people into a space and making them feel like they're 
fully invested, fully emotionally invested in the surroundings of what the, the bride and groom wanted. Mm-hmm. And we surprised them with a couple of things because one of the items was we had we have this pond, this beautiful big pond, and she didn't know where she wanted to get married. She didn't know like, do I get married under like a structure, which was, she was an older bride. So she was like, oh, that's too predictable. So I built a dock, a little dock that floated out to the middle of the pond. And I had her, them step onto the opposite side of the, of the pond. They got onto the dock, we, rig it, we rigged it. So they were able to stop the dock in the middle of the pond and their officiant performed the ceremony right there. And all 150 guests each were holding candles surrounding the exterior edge of the pond at night. And it was so simple, but yet so breathtaking and probably one of the most memorable, if not most most unique weddings of all the weddings in my career that I've done. And not because it was a relative, but because she allowed me to make it that much more emotional. That, so it, it was, so they were standing in the middle of this small body of water. Yes. The, big the bridegroom so and the big, pretty, Yep. Okay. And then everyone else was surrounding, standing yes. on land. Yes. Along the edge of the, of the, of the pond, big pond. Yeah. And then once the ceremony was over, we maybe legally didn't do the right thing, but we shot fireworks off. So fireworks went <laughs> off, which was a surprise to the bride and groom. And then we had these four, four waiters, two on one side, two on the other, pulling the, the ropes to get them from side A to side B, got on, got on back onto land after they were, uh, you know, pronounced husband and wife. And then they moved into the tent for dinner, which was just really spectacular. Okay. That see, this is, that's really beautiful. And that sounds amazing. And this is another pro to, to having a home wedding is that it's, I mean, depending on your budget clearly, but like sky is the limit, right? Like you, you can do whatever you want on your own property on, or on your family's property. And you, you rigged a little, <laughs> a little, a little dock. That was yeah, that's, a and that, you're right. That is the beauty of doing an at-home wedding is that yeah. you have no one telling you no. Right. Uh, unless there's some safety issues in sure. place. But, you know, you go to venues and how many times have we all worked in venues, right? And then you have this great idea for a client, client falls in love with it and the vendor shuts you down because they just don't think it's doable. Liability issues. Right. Uh, constraints. We have another wedding the next day. I'm sorry, I can't, you know, you got to be out of here by midnight tonight, whatever uh-huh. it is. Um, I love that Aunt Maria's wedding on the, on the floating dock. Oh, That's so, so cool. Beautiful. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of at home weddings, I think, I think the, the consumer, right. Gets so overwhelmed, which I don't want them to. I want them to realize that yeah. this is going to be a larger memory that you'll la- will last a longer time. Cause typically like when you go to a venue, let's say you go to a bar barn venue or a hotel location or a specific venue that's built for, you know, modern, maybe it's a library or a gallery. Those are spaces that are used all the time. So yeah, you're just yeah. going into like a, into a canvas and sort of stepping into their work, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to at your home, that's your life. Mm-hmm. It might've been a home that you grew up in mm-hmm. that you're going back to, to get married at. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why I love them so much. Um, and it's not for everybody, but if you're listening and you are doing, you know, having your wedding at home, I, I definitely think there's going to be some, you know, great, great advice here for you. Um, David, was the pond? So this is what always, when I am working with a client and you, I'm sure the first thing you need to do as the planner is walk, do a walkthrough, right? Go, go look at the site, talk about logistics what is the best flow? Should we use the front of the house? Should we use the back of the house? Where's the caterer going to set up? Where was this pond on your property? So the pond was at the back side of the house. So you arrived to the front. We had cars valet parked. Yep. They arrived to the right side of the house, which was the west side, which turned into being cocktail hour the, in the gardens. Mm-hmm. And then after cocktails were over, we did this a little differently because we wanted to change it up. So they went from cocktails 
to the opposite side of the house that had a very big open space for the tent. Mm -hmm. And they went in there for dinner. Here's the cool thing. They went in there for dinner after ceremony. So far, no ceremony. I'm sorry, cocktails first, no ceremony yet. Go to dinner. I love so it. People are like, what are we doing? Where oh my God, I love that. Where's this wedding going to take place? And the bride and groom showed up at dinner in dinner attire. And then 20 minutes before dinner was over, we removed them, took them in the house and they got into her, she got into her wedding gown, he got into his tux. Then we asked all the guests to go to the into the forest. So there's a path that takes you to the back of the house in this long, beautiful alley that's just beautifully designed. And then everybody stood on the left and the right of the of the what would be considered the long aisle that would be in, in a church. And everyone held those candles. So when the bride and groom walked down that aisle, they walked past all their guests to the very end of the aisle and got on the dock. And then the guests followed them and lined up around the pond. It made everyone feel inclusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just a passive, you know, a passive guest just sitting in a pew or in a chair waiting for the ceremony to begin. They were part of the journey. Mm, I love that. What time of year was this? That was the month of June. Okay. June 6th, actually. Okay. So this is summer in Connecticut. Yes. It is warm. Yes. Um, let's talk about, we've been talking about candles so much lately with people from the podcast <laughs> and just, because candles logistically outside, right? How did these people, I want to know what the candles look like. How did it keep from getting wax on people's hands? Like, what did you do? Great question and a great easy answer. Okay. So you can buy candles that will be long enough in length yeah. that come with a cup around the top that keeps the flame from being safe and stops the dripping of the wax to go down to your hand. So it's a simple thing. It's a, I mean, it's a basic inexpensive cost. It's purposely for the use of typically a memorial. Got but it. You would use it in this format, obviously for celebrations. Okay, so maybe if somebody was Googling it, they could put candle for a memorial or something. Correct. Yeah, okay. Handheld candle memorial, something like that. Oh yeah, great. And so it has that beautiful glow. Oh yeah, there's a, does it like a little piece of paper almost in the middle? Some they of have some them. that have paper and they yeah. have some that have the, the, the cup one we kept for the top because it was so close to people's faces and there were multiple age ranges. So you want oh, yeah. people to be safe. Yeah. Good, good, good. See, I love getting to the nitty gritty on these very specific logistics. Sometimes it's helpful. Okay. All right. So that's fun. So thank you for, and God, I love that. It's bass backwards the way you did it, yes. but in a good way. Yes. Because that's what pe I love flipping weddings upside down because yes. I think that we are so, especially us in the industry, but most importantly, those that are wanting right now to listen and find out a way to make their wedding different. Sometimes you don't have to always keep that same regimented, yeah. you know, formula. Yeah. And then after the ceremony, did dancing happen? Were they, did they dance? So at, while the ceremony was going on, the yeah. table, the tables that were set in the tent were flipped mm -hmm. and it was shifted into a lounge area with a dance floor that Love was it. already preset with a stage with a band. Love it. Love that. This is also a good example too, David, of, Every once in a while, I'll hear from a listener who's like, you know, we don't really want dancing. What yeah. can I do so that people aren't so, so, you know, turning this wedding upside down would also be kind of a nice idea for somebody who isn't into dancing. Let's start with cocktails. Let's move into dinner. Let's have the ceremony. And then, you know, maybe it's a short wedding or, or there's, there's other kind of little fun activities or micro events to do. Yeah, there's lots of things I have found that you can do to not decrease the length of your wedding, but elevate the experience of it. So mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't want, you know, three hours of dancing, which sometimes to me is a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of an odd energy too. I mean, people look foolish after a while and sometimes they don't like the music that's playing. So you can yeah. create moments yeah. like we, for that particular wedding and for other weddings, you know, you might do a trio or, or a, um, a trio of violinists or cellos, or you might have a singer come up and perform for 20 minutes. And then you cut in between those smaller sections of dancing. If you want to have a little bit of dancing. You make me think about, and I'm going to forget her name, but you'll remember it. 
when we were at the David Tatera experience in Rhode Island, day two, two the redheaded, Mandy beautiful, Harvey. oh God, David. I know. She was incredible. Yeah. Like her performance, her singing, everybody, I looked around the room at one point, everybody was just like jaw open, staring at her, like in love. Some people crying just watching her, listening to her voice, the lighting that you had on her. Incredible. That was so good. Yeah. Okay. Let's come back to home weddings. Let's come back. I got to come back. Okay. So we talked about kind of the first step and, you know, presumably a lot of people listening are not hiring a wedding planner. Although please, please, please try to hire a wedding planner. If you're having a (laughs) wedding at home. Yes. Okay. But I understand not everybody has it in their budget, but strongly, strongly advise that you have a professional walk through the space, preferably a wedding planner, right? There are wedding planners out there who will consult with you on an hourly basis and charge an hourly fee to walk through the space and give you an idea of the flow and what you can do. Um, I think a rentals person, if you're going to be getting a tenting and, 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 and tables and chairs, a, a rentals specialist is a really good alternative to a wedding planner. Would you say David to walk? Through? I would agree. You, you use a term, which I love rental specialists, because when you think about it, the wedding planners providing timelines and flow and details and getting budgets, but a rental professional um, that knows what they're doing. Yes. It actually save you money. And also get you give you the right advice for what's needed and quantities that are needed. And sometimes planners um, just don't have the know all of all of that because yes. it does sometimes get determined by the caterer. Um, but it also gets helpful. It's also helpful from the rental specialist. I think it's a brilliant move, Michelle. I think it's a great idea. It's you're right, David. It's probably because you're as you're saying this. I remember my my longtime friend been working with her for years, Kathy Newby. Every time we go to a site visit at a home for a home wedding, she's got her little rolling, you know, the measure, rolling tracker. Yeah. Big, yep. And she's measuring around and she's taking notes and she'll get back to me and be like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's the space. Here's the size. Here's how many tables we can fit. And that's what you want when it comes down to it. You want specs. You need somebody who knows how to measure the space, who knows if this is, if this surface is going to be okay for people to walk on. Um, so yes. Okay. I think it's really helpful for those that are considering a wedding at home. That'll help not just the, the, the couple, the family, but, but the, the vendors is to get very familiar with if you can, or if your planner can certainly provide this is to lay out a, to scale floor plan. Even if it's as simple as an all seated floor plan, Mm -hmm. you are looking at a very basic footprint of the reality of your actual usable space. And you can line up and create your walkway patterns. You can determine where the back of the house will be for catering. It might be your garage if possible. If you need porta potties or luxury restrooms brought in, where does that go? It helps you feel as if everything is in control, which it should be. Mm -hmm. And a floor plan will will definitely help the consumer. And once again, a rental specialist is going to know or know people who you can rent those portable restrooms from and where the best space is for them because they know the ones that need water, they need electricity. Um, And same thing with, you know, what's going to be needed for a caterer. Another common misconception, most people that hire me for home weddings is they're like, we have a huge, fabulous kitchen. The caterer is going to love it. And then I have to tell them, actually, the caterer really does not want to use your kitchen. Yeah. And you don't want the caterer using your kitchen. (laughs) They don't want to um, because it's a a liability issue for the catering company. B, you don't want, you know, grease spills on your beautiful floor. Um, There's smoke. There's you you might have gas maybe coming in and touring the home. It's 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 a quite crazy scene, a catering kitchen. So they're going to want to use a garage most likely or bring up a pop up tent to create their own space. Okay. Um, the other thing with regard to flow is, you know, I think ideally at the very least you have two spaces, right. That you can use 
for ceremony and then cocktail reception, dinner and dancing, right? So yes. oftentimes if there's only those two spaces, do you want to explain this, David, how that would work? You could do a flip. I, you could, you know, the flip is not always my enjoyment to do because it requires a little bit more labor, which is an expense to the consumer. So like Michelle sharing is that, you know, you typically, are, I'll give a, a typical uh, wedding would be you arrive, you have cocktails first or second. So you would have cocktails first, ceremony or ceremony, then cocktails. That's been a big flip lately. People have been in cocktails more so than after ceremony. Yeah. And then after ceremony, you're going to go into dinner. Um, so having two spaces, if you're lucky with three, great. But you want to make sure that the spaces are not far apart from one another either. Especially if you're on a property or if you've got a small amount of space, you want to maximize a small space. But if you have a large space, you want to minimize the space. So there's not a lot of moving around. And, and remember, you can't fully, you know, the expense to cover the grass or the dirt is out of, out of line for budgets. So you want to remember people are walking through what form of turf, what form of gravel, what form of dirt. We want to keep in mind, like you were sharing earlier, Michelle, when you arrive at someone's home, you're not just looking at the beauty of the space. You're looking at the reality of what the guests have to go through to get from point A, B, C, and D, and so on. Yeah, thinking about, you know, a family member who has special needs, maybe Correct. they're in a wheelchair, you know, maybe um, they need assistance. Can they climb up those steps or or that hill, that driveway, right? So um, definitely. And flipping a space is not ideal. Uh, it can work and it does work. I think one of the other pros to having a home wedding too which I would back up on a little bit is that you don't have the time constraint when it comes to delivery of rentals That's as true. you would at a venue, you know, oftentimes couples incur even more expense in delivery and pickup fees because a lot of these venues, especially right now in 22, which are doing wedding after wedding, after wedding, after wedding, your rentals company would love to deliver on a Thursday or a Friday, but your venue is like, nope, it's got to be delivered between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Saturday, <laughs> yeah. which is like super expensive and logistically really challenging. Okay. The other thing about having a wedding at a home is permits. Uh, oftentimes you need to get a permit uh, from often the homeowners association where the home is, um, a lot of homeowners associations make you apply and have special rules and want to know all of the logistics. Uh, if there isn't a homeowners association, you have to at least go to the city and find out what their rules are because there's noise ordinances in a lot of cities. Yes, there I'm are. Sure, in LA where you live, David. Oh God, we so have much a 10 a.m. 10 p.m. cutoff. Yeah, Done. and it's like their test. They want a certain decibel level for yep. the speaker, uh, and it can be really because the last thing you want is somebody you know coming and shutting you down because it's too loud. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Michelle. I think a lot of people who are assuming to have their wedding at home, which is a great idea, right? They don't think about the parameters that surround it based upon what you shared, sound ordinances, permits, traffic flow. Uh, will they allow ballet parking? If you're, like you said, in a homeowners association, you, it's almost impossible sometimes to get that approved. Mm -hmm. Someone might just have a stick up their butt and they just don't want you to have a party that night. Yeah. So you really need to do all of these things far in advance of actually making the determination if this is going to work. Mm -hmm. So find out that information first before you start building your vendor list and signing your deposits and yeah. finding out later you can't do it. Yeah, all this to say, and we should have said this at the top is your idea right now, maybe to have that wedding at your aunt's home or your mother's home, but don't hire anybody and choose a date until you've gotten all of this figured out first, that you know it's a good space, that you know it's going to be allowed by your homeowners association, that you get in touch with the city and find out what the rules and regulations are, and even the police department. Um, I've, I've done that many times. And then 
And then you'd be like, once you pass all these tests, then it's like, okay, let's actually get this going. Let's, let's it's like getting your driver's ready. license. You can't go drive your car yeah. without your driver's license. Yes. That's yes. the analogy. Yes. Um, see, these are the, okay, people, this is the not sexy parts of wedding planning, by the way, <laughs> at all. It's not sexy. Uh, like liability insurance, huge yes. at a home wedding. Because who's ever home that is, they're, they're, they're taking on a huge liability and having this many people at their home for an event. You bring up a good point again, because with the liability of safety, number one, and then there's also the liability separately for the abundance of alcohol that is served. Mm. So when I always recommend when someone's having a party at home, do not go to Costco and buy your own alcohol and put it on the bar or put it on your tables and have guests self-serve it's a liability on you as the homeowner and host of the event. If you hire a caterer, it becomes the liability of whom is bringing the content onto the property and serving it to the guest. So be very, very well aware of it. You may think it's a great idea to go out and get those really inexpensive bottles in abundance, but it can turn out to be one of the biggest nightmares of your life. Ooh, that's really a good point, David. Take that liability off of you. It, you know, nine times out of 10, when people are purchasing their own alcohol, they think it's going to be a huge cost savings, but it's not that much. Mm -mm. And it's really hard to determine how much alcohol to buy, first of all. And yes, this liability issue may not be worth it. You know, you know, your guests, you know, who's coming. Um, and sometimes you don't know people so well. It can get hairy. Mm -hmm. Okay. We talked about restrooms. How many, I'm so, I'm curious to know your school of thought on this, David, how many toilets do you think you need per person? <laughs> you know, it's, it's the most unflattering and yet, again, not sexy part of the business. No, but it's important. Um, it is. So I always tell people that you want to, first of all, uh, override and try to have more facilities than you need for the purposes of people waiting and complaining that they're waiting in line. And also you need a, you need someone on the ground, depending on size of the facility to make sure it's cleanly, the cleanliness of it is kept oh, yeah. up throughout the term of like five or six hours. So I typically would say, so for, we're doing a project right now. So we've got 80 guests coming to a home and we're doing two, two separate trailers male and female, not trailer split male and female. And they each will have four facilities, separate, separate stalls. Oh, wow. Each of the four. So that's eight, that's eight yeah. stalls for 80 people. That's one per 10 butts. Correct. That's a lot. It's but but people don't want to wait. I they love don't. it personally. And, I and, love know, that. <laughs> it, it's a good number, but you know, I think a lot of people assume that like these luxury um, bathroom facilities are terribly expensive. They're actually not that no. terribly expensive. Um, it, it's cheaper for you to go get that than have people ruin three of your bathrooms inside your home and then have to have your bathrooms fixed. And these, these restrooms that you rent, these nice ones often, co they come with attendants. Yeah, oh, yeah, they come absolutely. with people there who are making sure they're working properly and keeping them clean. Correct. Um, so I, I love a really, I, I'm, I think they're really cool. A lot of these portable restrooms, like a lot of them are really fancy inside, have great running water, really good lighting. Um, you could put florals in them. They smell good. Uh -huh. Like they're really, really nice. Yes, and they are. you don't have to worry, you know, later on to go back into your home and be like, oh my God, how many people use this toilet today? <laughs> You know, like your house is untouched. Yeah, parking. We went, we talked about parking. We talked about valet. Valet is the way to go, peeps. I mean, it just, it really, really is. Um, again, I think one of the biggest cons against having a home wedding can be a neighbor. We can't choose our neighbors, people. Mm -hmm. You know, you buy a home and you really cross your fingers that you're going to have some great neighbors, but there are some real asshole neighbors out there. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. And that can be the biggest threat to having your wedding at a home is that neighbor who's 
a total jerk and really angry all the time. So what do you do? I, I, I can tell you what I do. What do you do? David? I, I, I can tell you what I tell all my clients to do. Yes. Whatever day your wedding is, you have two things that I you, you, rule of thumb that I tell my clients to do okay. in the vicinity of whom, whom is around you, whether it be six homes or two homes, whatever that number is several months prior to the date of your wedding, you send a lovely note to your neighbor with a lovely gift to let them know that we, what we are hosting a wedding at our home on this date and at this time. And we certainly don't want to inconvenient you, but we want to let you know that this is a big moment in our life. And in the, in the basket or the box could be a candle, a gift, a book, a, whatever it is that you want with a lovely note. That goes in advance almost to the day of the, when you would do like a save the date. So they're mm -hmm. already preset knowing this is coming up in six months. Yeah. And then two weeks prior to the wedding, you do the same thing as a friendly reminder with a smaller something. It could be a bottle of wine or champagne. Just enjoy our moment tonight with us. I know you can't be with us, but this is our this is our family and friends that are coming to this celebration. So then you're not like, it's not like a punch in the gut where they're like dealing with the, the base of the music or the line of the cars or the issues of the, all of that. You're being the better neighbor, which makes a bad neighbor actually consider to think maybe it's now the time to be a nice neighbor because they were so nice to me. Yeah. Yes. So good. You know, and the other thing is uh, to in the letter that's closest to the wedding date, write in the letter. Like if you know they're going to be home, hopefully by sending them something in advance, they're going to make plans to go out of town. Right. That would be our ideal. But if they don't and you know they're going to be in town, you tell them in the letter, listen, if you need anything, here's the phone number to my wedding planner. Here's the phone number to my cousin. Here's the phone number to whoever. Please call us before calling anybody else. Because the last thing you want anybody to do is be making complaints to the police department and then the cops showing up, right? So we always, always want them to know that please, please, please contact this person, this person, or this person, or, you know, come knock on the door or whatever it is. I yeah, had a wedding. Michelle, yeah. We did something where we had, we, we were working for a client who had a really, just an asshole neighbor, like just, just, just not a nice person. So we, we knew that no matter what was going to happen, at least I didn't know the client knew, and I learned more about the scenario. So, you know, similar to what you're saying, we actually had the client send over um, reservations at a restaurant of a high, a, a really nice restaurant. Good. And the, the hosts of the home for the wedding was paying for it. So listen, if that's going to cost you 150 bucks to $200, the value of that to send them out, assuming they're going to accept it is really helpful for you because it just relieves one of those other worries that you have no control over. Yeah. Yeah. I had a similar situation um, where the couple was getting married at the, at the bride's family home where she grew up and the, it was a gated community and they shared like a long driveway off of the street, these two homes. And so we knew logistically that we were going to need, you know, people were going to be walking up this long driveway after they dropped their car off at the valet or some instances, you know, elderly people might be driven all the way to the, to the, to the, to the, to the house. And this neighbors had been there forever as well. But as long as the bride can remember, there's always been an issue with these neighbors. They were just like, always like just difficult, difficult people. And she's like, I'm in this weird position because I've known them all my life as a child growing up. So I feel weird not inviting them to the wedding. Cause I feel like it's kind of like, she's like, I really could care less that they come, but like, I've no, I know their kids. Like I, I know these people, mm -hmm. I hope they don't come. Mm -hmm. And then the groom is like, should we just like offer to pay for them to go to like the Ritz Carlton in the city for the weekend? And they, they were feeling kind of weird. Like, should we just, should we offer to pay for them to go somewhere? Or are they going to be insulted and then be like, I can't believe you're not inviting me to the wedding and then making a bigger stink about it. So it's, it's always like this difficult decision in the end, they invited them. Oh, um, but 
Luckily, this family had already planned on being out of town that weekend. <laughs> so they were, they were, they won. They were winning both ways. But we did need to, to ask them and say, like, we're going to need the use of the driveway. Can we do a little turnaround here? And then we have this generator, right? This is another thing that we'll talk about is power, right? For the, for these events. And it was, you know, a movie set quiet generator, but we didn't want it to show. And the way the property was built, I really wanted to put it on the other side of the fence on this neighbor's property. So they let us do it. We were, I, I, I'm the one that went nasty and sweet talked because the couple didn't want to do it. Yeah. But all sorts of little, you know, particular, you know, details having to do with the home and the families and the neighbors. Oh, you brought that word up, generator, the death of my life. Wow. Generators. I, I, I talk about that. Yes, please. Oh my gosh. So everyone, every single person right now that's listening to this podcast. David's very close to the microphone. This is I'm important. begging Listen. you to understand that a generator is a lifeline to success. When your power goes down, your party's over. Okay. And that means your power might just go down because your facility, your home can't carry the amps that are needed, the electrical, the electrical needs that are needed to carry lighting. Uh, by the way, a coffee urn can blow your whole coffee uh -huh. urn from a cater yeah. and blow the power. So my point is, is that generators are a little bit, you know, of a cost into the overall budget, but it's, it's literally the oil, the energy, the gasoline that fuels your party to stay afloat and alive. And I'm going to use an example because this was something I learned a long, long, long time ago as in my early years of party planning. I had this um, wedding in the Hamptons in New York and the father of the bride was this just very pompous doctor. And he thought just because he was a doctor, he knew everything about everything. And you just sort of have to know how to, you know, move and flow with your clients. So I informed him that we can get a whisper generator, which is a quiet generator. You don't hear the noise. And we would put it on his back property so he, it could cover the lighting, the catering, and the band, right? So he said, listen, I don't need a generator. I built this house. Come on. I built this house. And I can make sure that this house is not, the lights aren't going to go down. I said, listen, doctor so-and-so, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to get a generator even if you don't tell me to get one, because I will be responsible for when this all goes down. So he refused, absolutely 1000% refused. It's so weird. Here we go. The Thank moment goodness. that our wonderful Sicilian, wonderful dad, who's a doctor, wanted to get on the stage because he was going to surprise perform a solo number from Frank Sinatra that he'd sing to his daughter. My hand to God, <laughs> as soon as he got on the stage, the lights blow. Oh my God. So I had, I had three choices. One was to run because <laughs> I couldn't do anything. Two was to jump in the pool to sort of just get away visually. And three was to do nothing. I took, I opted for three because they really honestly one, two, and three, I could do nothing. So he was so delusional. This is a funny story, by the way. So delusional that he actually sang the whole number, never realizing that the, the power went down. So when he was done during his song, we were figuring out the electrical issues going right. on and right. got the lights back up. So he didn't even notice, David. He's so the guy was so delusional, but the point, I, I'm grateful because he probably would have gone after me for the purposes of it going down. But my point to everyone listening right now is you don't want that stress. You don't need that stress. There's a solution to avoid that stress. So when someone says you need a generator, there's a reason why you need a generator, not for hurricanes, for your wedding. Right, right. And, and actually... I, I know for you, you were probably like sweating bullets, oh, lost but like days. it would be best. It, it, what a better scenario for it to go down during, you know, the father, the bride solo versus a, a friggin' 10 piece band or like, you know, the DJ playing yes. and losing power when there's everyone out on the dance floor. Yeah, it was karma. It was all karma. Which happens. Oh, yeah. It went down on him because he just was a really challenging human being. But the reality is, is that the wedding wasn't wasn't faulted by any stretch of the imagination, other than it appeared, luckily for me, that he was doing a solo number sort of in a 
modified version of doing it under the stars as opposed yeah. to doing it with the lights on. <laughs> Yeah. And, and then here's the other thing. I mean, obviously like, yes, you, you need so many dedicated 20 amp circuits per, yes. you know, speaker, friggin' coffee maker, blender, uh, uh, the lighting that you're going to set up and the market lights in the backyard. And every time I mention this to the homeowners and it is always the dad, they're like, what well, don't be crazy. Like we've lived in this house 30 years. We've never had an issue, but sir, you've never had a party with a hundred people, right? How many dedicated circuits do you, I don't know, but we're, and the thing is also when you have something, let's even with your house, let's take your case, David, out in the middle of the freaking forest, you have to have a generator out mm -hmm. there because there are no outlets to plug into, Correct. right? If you're having dancing Correct. there. And so your band is going to plug into the generator. So it's a suit. And yes, it is pricey. Again, this goes back to our whole point that a wedding at a private home is pricey, but my God, it's the lifeline. Like you have to have power for everything. And there's a formula. You even brought it up. I mean, when you figure out what the amps are needed for, from a generator, for the things that are needed to be electrified, to brought that equipment in, it's a formula. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like Michelle and I are coming up with like, oh, get that pretty generator. It's going to really carry you through the night. <laughs> yeah, I'm really. No, there's a there's a number of what you need to to have on site, and sometimes, sometimes depending on where you're located and the size of your event, we also will do a second backup generator. Mm -hmm. And that that's that's costly. But if you're having an event, let's hypothetically say someone on this podcast is listening, going, we're having 400 guests. You know, I would probably say, depending on what's happening in that environment, you might need a second backup generator to support it. Yeah. Yeah. And get a movie quiet one if you can, because they can be loud. Those old school yeah, ones yeah, are loud. Terrible. Okay. Oh, this is so good. I, I'm, we're, we're good at this, David. Who knew? I feel like between the two of us, we have like a hundred years under our belt. I feel like it. <laughs> Um, okay, let's talk about lighting. Speaking of power, because again, somebody could have a beautifully landscaped backyard, right? And they're like, no, 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 I've got, I've got this beautiful lighting and the trees. Um, you know, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Lighting at any event is super important, right? Yeah. But when you don't have a venue that has the lighting set up for an event and you're at a private home, how important is lighting? Yeah, all that time you spent on creating a beautiful wedding and then all of a sudden you can't see anyone or see the flowers or see the couple on the dance floor and you're trying to get that ambient light from the landscape lighting, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and also, by the way, it, you know, you do, you do need lighting for safety purposes as well. And yeah. that's, that's, you know, we, you don't, your homes that you're thinking about having your, your wedding in are not built with safety lighting for pathways that you have to get from point A to B to C to D to E um, throughout the celebration. Right. Right. And so at the very least, you want to do those, those market lights in the back, right. That give some sort of illumination to the general area. Um, I've had so much fun doing specialty lighting and trees, right. Or, or when we've got pin spots on all the tables or a pattern wash on the grass, um, safety lighting. Yes. Those guests walking back to, you know, uh, from the backyard to the front of the house, right. Where they, where, where they go to the valet stand, the valet itself needs some, yeah. some lighting at their again, liability. That's liability. Again. Liability. hundred percent. These people have been drinking. Okay. Yeah. They've been drinking at your wedding. And even if they're catching a shuttle, that's picking them up. You want to make sure they walk safely through that beautifully landscaped rock garden you have with the little pet pavers. Um, so lighting is super, super important. I'll tell you a funny story to add to yes. these just reasons of why house, house celebrations and weddings, all the things that Michelle and I are sharing are important. There was a wedding we were doing in Washington, DC, and um, it was a big backyard gathering. And we, we, had lighting, but not that I don't think ample enough lighting for what I think this particular client should have had. But there was an area on the property that was sort of to the back side of where this the tables were set were for dinner. 
And it was, there was a backdrop behind them that was an existing fountain that the homeowners had installed when they probably built the house. Um, a fountain that was large enough that a couple little children could probably swim in it, right? Okay. So, but it wasn't illuminated. So oh. it wasn't part of, they didn't want it illuminated. It wasn't part of the lighting, you know, the lighting lists of to, of to do's. But one guy, I'll never forget this. He was probably a little too tipsy, thought that the back of the tent was the front of the tent at that point. So he walked that way towards the fountain and he hit probably like a two, two foot ledge and fell into the fountain. <laughs> so my point again is, you know, again, alcohol, <laughs> people having fun, disorientated because they're not, it's not their property. They're yeah. in an environment that's laid out. So you have to create this sort of almost laser beam perimeter facade of lighting. So people understand this is where you can be. If it's dark, it's probably not the area you're supposed to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's the ambient lighting and then there's the safety lighting. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the lighting in, you know, again, if the caterer needs to create a pop-up tent, they'll probably bring their own lighting, but that goes back to our generator because Correct. everybody's running their lighting and the band is running in the DJ and the whole nine. Okay. Lighting is really important. Um, I hope we're not scaring people from having a home wedding because it really is beautiful. It really is. Everyone, David, good point. Let's take a moment here and calm everybody's nerves. It's absolutely beautiful. It is a memory like no other, yeah. you know, especially for, let's say it's your parents' home, you know, and, and they're like, oh, I love this home. You know, my daughter was married here. Um, and you're like, oh, and you're the, right after your ceremony, when you go into that room by yourselves and you're like, oh my God, we just got married. And, you know, you're like, remember when we snuck out and then like this is the first place we made out in high school babe in this house <laughs> like there's there's so many like there's so many beautiful things about having a home I mean a, a, a wedding in a private home and I memories. think what's really great Michelle is that we you know our goal today our time with you today is that we're giving you not the pitfalls. We're giving you the way to avoid those moments. And, sure. you know, we love, I mean, it's clear that Michelle and myself love at home weddings, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it is it's true. It's, it's, it's completely accurate. Yes. Um, and guests sometimes more so would love to be at someone's home as well, celebrating in their backyard or in their tent or whatever it might be. So we just want you all to just know that there are ways to alleviate your stress but if you're not listening to us, you're going to increase your stress. Right. So we're right. talking about budget, but we're also talking about alleviating stress. And we're also talking about the very important things that you do logistically need yeah. and the other items that you may not necessarily have to have. Yeah. And getting ready, forget about it. You, you're in your home. There's plenty of space to get dressed, to no. get ready, to get your makeup done, to like chill out. You have your own private bathroom inside. Like there's so many great things. It's my favorite is to do a wedding at a private home, especially the people that over the years have come to like small parties and dinners. And then they go in your backyard and they're like, oh my God, David, I've never seen your home like this before. Right, this right. is incredible transformation. Um, One other unsexy thing, not sexy thing I want to talk about is trash, rubbish, yeah. garbage. A lot of garbage is created at a wedding and you're not going to be able to shove it all in your bins. So you've got to make sure that you do speak about this with your caterer, because not every caterer will assume this, nor will you know that you need to tell the caterer that they need to haul all the trash away. And please know that they are going to charge you extra for that, but mm -hmm. it's really worth it. Good point. Great point, by the way. Thank you, David. Yeah, really, really important. Because I think that's something that most people will figure out after the wedding is over. Uh -huh. And they're like, uh-oh. Now and I the raccoons have just thrashed through yeah. everything. Yeah. Very good. Do you think, David, uh, a lot of people have asked me this, like, how do we, how do we end it? 
Because let's say we need to stop. We have to have a hard stop on the music by 10 o'clock. What are some of your favorite ways or recommendations to actually let the guests know that this is the end of the party now and they have yeah, to Yeah, well, that's another great question. I think, well, first, the first thing is you don't want to turn the lights off. The second thing is you don't want to say, sorry, party's over. Um, I've been to parties where wedding planners would go, okay, guys, everyone, we're wrapping this up and the, 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 the shuttles are out to the left and, you know, it's a little aggressive. So I think there's a beautiful way. And if you're really, if you hire a really great planner and that's not based on cost, but based on emotion and they understand how to flow the night and shift the movement of the energy of the music. And you know, you go like 20 minutes before a wedding is going to end your decibels and your energy should increase 20 minutes before it ends to give you the ability to then bring the, the volume down, change the music. So you start to see, it's like you're watching a show on Broadway or a movie. It changes the emotion and you're starting to realize as a guest, we're coming to the end as opposed to a hard cutoff. And what could be very really lovely is the host, which could be the mother and father, or the host, which could be the couple that's getting married, can give a wonderful thank you for being part of this evening. And we are so grateful that you're here with us. And thank you for making this night so wonderful. And they send them on their way. I love it's that. that. It's that period to a book that I think completes the moment. I love that. I love that. Where it's this heartfelt, like, we love you guys so much. This was a magical yep. night. We wish you all the best. We can't wait to share photos with you. You're amazing. Get home safe. And then maybe there's just some light music. Very soft at- music where they where they depart. Again, yeah. like the end of a movie. Yeah. Um, and you don't want, what you don't want is, this makes me nuts when I see it, is you don't want a DJ coming up and saying, all right, come on, everybody. We know the last song on the, on the dance floor. And you certainly don't want the band leader to finish the night off. I just think that, because we're talking about weddings at home, it should be very much about yeah. the host or the homeowner. Yeah. And if we had to do a hard stop because of a noise ordinance, and now we have soft music playing, it's okay for the couple to just then just like go yeah. down through the people and say, thank you so much, hug and kiss as Absolutely. they slowly make their way, you know, to the depart their car they're leaving in or into the house or whatever it is. I love that. I love that as a kind of like send off heartfelt send off goodbye, send off to the guests. You're amazing. Love that. So good. I knew you'd have a good answer for that, David. <laughs> All right. Do you think we covered it? Oh, I i mean, one little tip, and this is something that probably your rental specialist will tell you, but do not water the grass. And uh, also like, turn off the sprinklers. Yeah, the system, the timer. The system the, in general. Yes. So that's, I've seen like, that It's happen. usually like three days in advance, usually depending on how hot it is outside. If you're in a humid environment like Connecticut, that's humid in the summer. And sometimes you even get rain, right? In the summer. Um, If you're in dry California and you need to kind of, or the grass will die maybe a couple days beforehand, but just, you know, maybe talk with your landscaper as well. But just remember the sprinkler system, like Mm -hmm. turn it off. You don't want people's chairs or table legs sinking into the grass. (laughs) Very good. Very good. That was a good episode. Thank you, David, so much for being with us again. Oh, it's just a ton of fun. And I love to hang out with you and obviously have everybody hang out with us. Yeah, we're fun. Okay. After I stop recording, don't hang up. I have a question for you, Veronica. You'll edit that part out. All right. Happy planning, everybody. Thank you again, David. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.